duty to let Parker Tipton, who Parker has actually preached here before, he filled in for us while we were looking for Norman and Joyce. Uh, just hadn't found them yet. Uh, but Parker is going to speak this afternoon. Parker's been one of my uh, good friends for the uh, past five years, maybe four or five years, I guess. Him and Tanner uh, grew up together. They've been real good friends for a long time. Uh, once he uh, began to study the Bible and uh, studied with Tanner and, and my grandfather some, uh, it didn't take him long. He realized it was the truth, and he, uh, it's his desire in his heart to do what's right in God's eyes, so he made the commitment and became a Christian and hadn't looked back ever since. He's been growing, and uh, I'm proud of him. And I know Tanner and uh, all his family and friends are, but uh, he, he, he loves God, and uh, so we're excited to have him uh, as a part of our congregation here, uh, but now you'll be able to hear him speak this afternoon as well.
scripture reads, Now therefore this, uh, this shall you say to my servant David, This says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. That's very important. And when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, when David is gone and he has returned to the dust of the earth, when he is dead from this earth, when he uh, returns uh, to uh, rest with his fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. This is very important to answering this question. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this kingdom that we read of is going to be uh, established forever. The person that's going to establish this kingdom is going to be a Davidic descendant. It's going to be from the seed of David, right? Will there be a Davidic descendant? Uh, will it come to pass? Let's keep reading. Let's keep studying. Um, you see, when we, when we read of prophecies, when we read of their fulfillment, uh, it is like a puzzle. And it's like we're putting a, a puzzle together. You see, uh, so many uh, faiths today, uh, they, they, they hinge on one piece of scripture. Uh, they, they hinge on one verse. Uh, and they don't take the Bible for what it is. But if we really want to begin to understand where we come from, when we really want to understand our faith, we've got to take these different verses together, these prophecies together, and we've got to piece them together like they're a puzzle. Turn with me to Isaiah in chapter 2. Isaiah in chapter 2, and we're going to start there in verse 2. And the scripture reads, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. When will it come to pass? It will come to pass in the latter days. This is very important. That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. It will be on the top of the mountains. That's where it will be found. It shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. This is also very important in seeing the fulfillment of this prophecy. All these characteristics that we can read of. All, all nations will be there. It says, many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. This is also a very important characteristic, the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So where will it be? Where will the top of the mountains be? Where will these nations be flowing to? It will be found in Jerusalem. It will be found in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the top of the mountains. So who is this Davidic descendant? I'm, uh, I'm guessing everybody here today kind of has an idea who this descendant is to establish this kingdom. And it is Jesus Christ. But let's turn uh, and, and see it for ourselves in Luke. Luke in chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and in verse 30 it says, Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord of God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. See, we, we were just reading in Isaiah. We were just reading of scripture that was thousands of years before this. And here we have these characteristics coming into the fold. The house of the God of Jacob. Uh, a descendant of his, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This kingdom will last forever, right? Uh, we read that just, just a few moments ago. So did Jesus ever build this kingdom? Did it ever come to pass? Uh, turn with me to Acts in, in chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So when will the power come? It will come when the Holy Spirit is upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
Let's keep reading. Turn with me uh, one chapter over, and we'll start in verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues that the Spirit gave them utterance. So here we have it, the power is coming. Uh, the power is here, and, and we are ready uh, to see this prophecy come to fruition. Continuing in verse 5, it says, And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Uh, I believe this sounds very familiar, does it not? Uh, we were just reading a, a scripture just thousands of years ago, and here we have it. We have all nations flowing to it. We have uh, them flowing into Jerusalem. We have the Holy Spirit coming on to these men. We have the power of God at this place. So the power has come and we are seeing this, this prophecy is coming to fruition. And we have the place. Uh, the place is right. And is the time right? Uh, Acts 2 uh, and in verse 17 it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I'll pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your, your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And we, and we keep reading and we, and we go on down to 21. It says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We, we have a day of rejoicing. We have a day of salvation. We have a day of a kingdom that is being established. Are we in the right prophecy? Acts 2 and in verse 29 it says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. David has been dead for 2,000 years, and no one here at the day of Pentecost had any idea that, that David was still living. No one believed David was still living. Everyone knew that he had gone on to pass. But what we're doing here is, is he's, he's uh, pressing home uh, the point that his seed is here. His seed has come, and we have this Davidic descendant. See, no one thought David was truly dead. Verse 31, it says, He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. You see, we read there in Matthew 16 that the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, referring to death. Death couldn't hold Christ. He overcame it. He overcame those gates. You see, this is what his kingdom was established on. Peter said that he is the son of the living God, and that's what his uh, church will be established on. And when we read, uh, when we read of this uh, coming to fruition, when we read of this prophecy and its fulfillment, uh, we ask the question, uh, what church uh, are we reading of here? In verse 36 it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that the God that made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. We, we were reading of, of the church coming into the fold. What, what is this church? Uh, we, we read of uh, this, this one church in the Bible. We read of this prophecy, that this, this kingdom that will be established forever. I think one way to go about it is if we actually put ourselves back into the day of Pentecost and we think about those people that are being baptized, those people that are uh, pricked in their heart, and you ask the question to them, what church are you a member of? What church were you just added to? Well, their answer is going to be that they only know of one church. They don't know of any other church. I was, I was crying, crucify him, crucify him, just, just three or four, uh, or uh, however long it was, uh, saying crucify him just moments ago uh, to their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm answering his gospel call. I'm seeing the power come in the form of the Holy Spirit. I only know of one church, and we bring that same person back in today's time, and we drive him down the road about 30 miles and we pass church after church after church with different man's name on it with different names on it we, 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 we tell them and we, and we try to uh, let them comprehend that there's different faiths that there's different teachings that throughout the years in the 1500s and the 1600s that there's been men to come along to, to write their different creed books is this man going to understand what we're talking about how is this man going to feel you see we have a problem and it is a problem that 
that God truly does not approve of. You see, the church that we read of here in the Bible, it was not a denomination. It was not a non-denominational church. It was actually a pre-denominational church. This church that we read of was pure, and they did have their faults, granted. But this church was pure. So is one church as good as the other? I ask the question, is one house as good as the other? Uh, turn with me to Matthew in chapter 7. Matthew in chapter 7. And in verse 24 it says, Therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to him a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who will build his house on the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So when we read of this teaching of Christ, was one house as good as the other? And it truly was not. We have the, the house that was built on the rock. It had the firm foundation, the foundation that Christ is the Son of the living God. Uh, one house is truly not good as the other. Is one wood as good as the other? Uh, we've got some master craftsmen in here, carpenters. Uh, they will tell you that one wood is not as good as the other. Uh, but when we look at Genesis and in chapter 6, we can see that one wood is not as good as the other. Genesis 6 and verse 14, it says, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And we read of different schematics of this ark that God asked Noah to build it with. We see that it says gopher wood. And you would ask someone today, could he have made it out of pine? Could he have made it out of oak? If he would have did that, I, I, do, I don't believe the, the ark would have uh, floated. And you get people today and, and they say, you know, well, well God, sent, God said uh, he, didn't, he never mentioned not to do this. Uh, when God was specifying to Noah here in Genesis in chapter 6, did he have to specify every species of wood not to use? And then at the end of that and say gopher wood is the acceptable wood. You see, one wood was not as good as the other. We come to the question often, and it can be an ugly question. Uh, are Church of Christ the only ones to go to heaven? We have a lot of people that, uh, that want to make uh, these accusations to us. Is that, that that's what we teach? That we're the only ones going to answer that? And how do we answer that? And it is a, uh, a troubling answer sometimes. It's, it's something that can get ugly. And it's something that we need to know how to address. Uh, because it can come up. And then I bring you back. To, the, to, to Noah's time. Let's go back to Noah's time and come at it in a perspective that someone wants to come to the Bible today. And we have what some may call the sinner's prayer, and I, and I present to you the flood prayer. You know, someone comes up to Noah and they say, so you're saying that this is the only boat that's going to float. You're saying that there is a flood that's going to come. You see what I'm saying? You say that there's only wood, there's only one type of wood that is acceptable for this boat. And you're saying that I have to have full faith and I have to board this one boat. You know, I've got a boat, you know. I believe that God loves me. I believe that he will save me, that he has mercy, and that my boat will be fine. Is this an attitude that is going to be acceptable to God? You see what I'm saying? When we, when we read of it coming forth and we can see everything that happens, this is, uh, this is crazy man's talk to come about. Uh, uh, something that God has laid before us is one boat as good as the other, is one wood as good as the other. You see, when, when, we, when we come about it with that type of attitude, we see what true arrogance really is. We see that my way is actually better than God's way. And that is truly unacceptable. You see, in 1 Peter in chapter 3, we read of uh, only eight souls were saved by water. Only eight souls were saved. So those boats that I was making reference to that uh, all those people may have had, you know they tried to get in them. You know they were running to their, their fishing boats trying to, to evade the flood water, but only eight souls were saved. You see, there was not one boat that was as good as the other. There was only one. No one outside the ark was saved, unfortunately. You see, many 
many times God has given people strict instructions that we can read of in the Old Testament. So we read of some strict instructions uh, for us uh, in the New Testament. And it's, these instructions are to obtain a sense of salvation in the Old Testament. And one of the best examples of this to me is in Exodus in chapter 12 when we read of the Passover. Turn with me to Exodus. Exodus in chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3 it says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb. Is one day as good as the other? He said on the tenth of this month. On the tenth of this month. Going, going right along, it says, And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbors uh, next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Is one lamb as good as the other? It has to be a lamb without blemish. It has to be a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. He gave them that. And now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Here we have these strict instructions. And we could, and we could keep going on. We, uh, there's, a, there's a certain, uh, uh, the gender, the age. Uh, we have the 14th day. We have a time to kill. We could, we could go through all of these schematics on the Passover. But what is the teaching here? You know, we have to do what God say. And, and again, we can go back into this day of, of the Passover. And, and someone can come up to Moses and they can say, oh, are you telling me that, that this one blemish on my lamb is not going to be good enough? Are you telling me this is the only day? You know, I'm going to be busy that day. I can't, I can't grab my lamb, man. I can't sacrifice my lamb, man. You see, you see, you see how, how crazy this attitude can truly be? You know, no one would have came up to Moses and said that. They did as he said. They did as he said. When we, when we go to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 28, it says that the children of Israel went away and did so. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. They had full faith in what God was speaking through Moses. They had full faith in this, and they went off and did it exactly as he said, and, the, and they passed over their firstborn. So is Church of Christ the only one going to heaven? That is a, that is a question that, that can be ugly, and, I, and I've said that earlier. The best way to go about uh, this question to me is to start in, in Ephesians. Turn with me to Ephesians in chapter 5. Ephesians in chapter 5. And I said earlier, when we're trying to, to teach these, these basic Christian principles, we have to start with building blocks, right? We've got to start with very simple teachings so that they can truly understand what is asked of us in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 23, it says, For the husband is, the, uh, is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. It's word for word. We can't argue with it, right? Christ is the Savior of the body. I don't know of anybody in the religious world that would call themselves a Christian that would argue against this point that Christ is the Savior of the body. So if we can establish that point, then we can establish that we want to be a part of that body, right? We want to be in the body. So then let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 4. It says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling. There is one body and there is one spirit. We only know of one body. You know, it said that Christ is the head of that body. And... You know, it really makes sense. You know, if, if we have one body, we're not going to have two heads. If we have one head, we're not going to have two or three bodies. Thinking of it in a physical aspect. To every human, naturally, we have one body, one head. So we've got one body, and we want to be in that body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 22 and verse 23 and it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we have reference of here in, in Ephesians that Christ is the head of the body. That we want to be in that one body and that this body is the body of Christ. 
we have here in Ephesians 1 that it says the body of Christ is his church. So if we can say that we want to be in the body of Christ, we want to be in the church of Christ. Now, of course, uh, if, we, if we do as we're told, if we, if we, if we follow uh, the gospel to the best of our ability, and we read and we study and we do as, as he said, we know that we can have full faith in heaven, right? You see, there's a, there's a story uh, of a little girl, uh, and she asked her, her dad one day, she asked him, does, does God do all things uh, in the best interest of man? You know, does, does God do everything in the best interest of us? And she asked this as her and her daddy were walking to church. And the mother was actually on the other side of town, and she was going to her church. You see, this was a, a split family here of two faiths. And she asked, she asked her dad, she said, does he do everything in the best interest of us? And of course, the dad said, of course. Of course he's going to do everything in the best interest of us. So then she goes on to ask her dad, then why didn't he make one church so that you, me, and mommy can all go to church together? You know, it's, it's, it's pretty powerful stuff when we think about it, when we, when we look at it like that and the answer to this little girl's question is that there is one church, that he did make one church so that that mother, that father, and that daughter could go together, but man came along and messed it up. And that is truly the conclusion of the matter that we have today. You see, uh, one church is not as good as the other. The only church that, that is good is the one that we read of here in this Bible. The one that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came to the cross and, and shed his innocent blood for. Uh, the one that we read of in Matthew 16 that he was going to establish on the rock that he was the son of the living God. Right? We read of the keys to that church. How we become members of it when we obey the gospel, when we hear the word and we believe upon it. When we repent, confess, we're baptized and we we read in, in Revelation in chapter 2 that to stay faithful uh, until death and we can receive that crown. Uh, have you tasted the pure milk of the word? Are, are you a Christian here today? If you're not, there'd be no better time uh, than to make that decision today to become a part of the greatest institution that the world has ever known. An institution that was uh, in the makings, in the, in the beginning of the creation an institution that's been around for thousands of years now. It's one that the head of it is Jesus Christ himself. Are you a member of that church? Uh, maybe you have become a member and you've strayed away. Maybe you need to come back. Uh, whatever you